Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to Our Front Porch. My name is Sue Scott. I'm the director of the Western Illinois Museum. And I'm Jill Brewer. I'm the history teacher at Cuba High School and I sponsor this little syndic here we call the Oral History of Forgot Tonya. And uh, we also streaming live today and thank you to Justin George over there. Yay! Thanks, um, Justin. Thanks, Justin. As, as we say on our front porch, there are no strangers. So out there in the virtual world, please let us know where you're joining us from and, and share your name if you're comfortable. So Joe, um, when you, I've been aware of the work you've been doing with the students for some time, and it's been really impressive. Thanks. And you gave me a call, and you're like, uh, I got this grant, and yeah. I got this program, and we got an idea, we want to do this work. And you're like, yeah, maybe I'll put up some posters in the museum. Could you do that for us? And I'm like, well, tell me more. Tell me more. And, and then the next thing I know, I'm in Oklahoma with you um, <laughs> yeah. at this great conference. Yeah. Uh, and um could you tell us a little bit about the grant and the yeah. that you've been working with? Yeah, so it, it's it's always tough to explain to people what exactly we're we're doing, but uh, Regina and I are participating in a grant by the NCHE, the National Conference for History Education. Uh, we are one of several folks around the country participating in this grant where we're asked to build a public history project with our students and a community partner. So that's kind of the real quick gist of it. And the goal of that grant is to elevate your rural history. And we're recognizing that rural history doesn't get a lot of attention. A lot of folks don't have a, a good public sort of memory of the unique cultural heritage things about it. And especially if you're, you know, aware in Illinois, we got a lot of rural students flying out of where they're from and saying things like, yeah, I'm not so sure I like and dig my town very much. So the goal of this grant has really been an opportunity for students to connect with some really meaningful history and recognize that, hey, we do live in a pretty unique cultural historical region here in Western Illinois, collectively referred to as Forgottonia. And I know some of our Macomb homies here today know all about the Forgottonia story, but we've really positioned Forgottonia in the, the kind of cultural capital of all this unique history that you're gonna hear about today. Yeah, you know, I learned so much, you know, when you think we're here to teach the students, well, the, teach, the students are teaching us, and um, as well as all the other participants in that Rural America mm -hmm. Experience grant, and um, it was just a phenomenal experience for me, so thank you for, for considering yes. us as a community partner. Uh, we have a special, a special message today from the program manager, Regina Holland. Uh, she's going to say a couple words, and she is the program manager for this grant from the National Educa Council of History Educators. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear from Regina. Hey. Don't let me unmute. Hold on a second. You're on mute. We all know that. Oh, I think you're muted, Davey. Yep, it was me. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's so so great to be here. I have been working with Joe and Sue for the past year, and so uh, what an honor it is to be able to join you this afternoon as the students, uh, you know, actually present their projects and the work that they've been doing. I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, the National Council for History Education as you get started. Uh, we do work to provide professional and intellectual uh, leadership to K through 12 teachers all over the United States. Our goal overall is to, to uh, you know, we're committed to helping them in teaching and learning and to appreciate uh, diverse histories. And so that is really kind of our background, whereas you see that the Rural Experience in America project that is funded by the Library of Congress, uh, this is a three-year project in scope. And so uh, right now, Joe is one of our year one teachers and his students are participating in year one. Uh, Joe's coming back for next year. So the students at Cuba High School will again get to experience that. He mentioned a little bit about the goals for our project. I just want to expand on that just a little bit as you get started today. Uh, first of all, uh, with this particular program, uh, we really do try to engage the teachers and the students in a rich, deep examination of rural history. So we we have brought in historians and community um, partners like Sue, uh, historic local historians to really make that experience uh, for the students and the teachers 
uh, so they can come to understand how important the history is of their community and then it, how it fits into the bigger narrative of our national uh, United States history. Uh, we also have been focusing on the impact of agricultural change across America and its effects on children, families, and communities in the United States. That's also part of the goals of this project. Uh, we have also really uh, been working diligently to bring the Library of Congress sources that are available on United States history, make those accessible to teachers and uh, to the students. And so Joe went through an intensive course where he learned uh, about how to use those resources through the Library of Congress and then his students have had the benefit of being able to examine those as well. Uh, then, of course, Sue has been helping with the local uh, history there in, um, you know, in Forgotten Tonia, which you're going to learn more about uh, today from the students, but also about the, the history of Illinois. So we really we have we have 98 teachers right now participating in year two. We are getting ready to select 15 of those uh, to to actually go on to implement a public history project with their students in the in the next school year. So that's kind of where we are in the process. Uh, and so so we provide work, uh, support for that work uh, through the through the uh, means of we provide a stipend uh, to help the, the, the students actually create this project where they're giving back to their community. And, um, and so really this particular project, we focus on historical inquiry, place-based education and service learning. And so those are kind of the three pillars that uh, you're gonna see at work today. And so thank you again for having me. I'm gonna turn it back over to Sue and Joe. I can't wait to see and hear firsthand from the students students today about all that they've learned this year. So thank you very much to Sue and Joe for, for uh, doing this work. It's so important. And thank you for having me today. Thank you, Regina. Regina from Georgia. Right. From Georgia. All right, um, guys in the audience, I'm going to pop over here. If you don't see me, that's OK. It's not about me. We're really here together to celebrate some of the work that these students have done. And I want to emphasize, uh, we asked them to follow their curiosity. From there, uh, we took a trip to the Western Illinois Archives. Uh, so shout out to John Hollis and Kathy Nichols from there. We're going to hear a little bit more from there. And then we tried to collect an interview uh, that they that they got to do about a topic in their local history that they were curious about. So um, let's give it up first. Would you guys welcome Amber and Jason are going to come up here first. Let's welcome them. All right. So. Um, First off, can you guys hear me? I'm still here. <laughs> so Amber uh, is a freshman at Cuba High School. Amber's involved with History Club, Scholastic Bowl, Drama Club. They enjoy writing, podcasting, other creative endeavors. Along with mom, Katie, Amber has volunteered for several years at the New Salem Historic Site in Petersburg, Illinois. And after high school, Amber's thinking about becoming a writer, maybe selling a book at some point. Amber is here to discuss her project, which is titled Dr. Francis Rainier, the Forgotten Hero of New Salem. So, Amber, can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to research this topic and the sort of questions you were hoping to ask? Sorry, I hope this is off the off. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's on, isn't it? Mm -hmm. is it Very good. Yeah. Is it on? Okay. Yes. Okay. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Girl. What, what do you think about the topic, Dr. Francis Rainier? Why did you want to research this topic? Well, I think that as a whole, New Salem is very interesting, and the people that live there are very interesting people that you can learn a lot from, especially at that time period. Um, but if I were to talk about every single person in New Salem, we would be here for about three hours. <laughs> um, yeah. So I decided to talk about a resident that I have personally volunteered in the cabin of, and that I really enjoy talking about, uh, Dr. Francis Rainier. Um, and talk about some of the questions. What kind of questions were you hoping to answer about Dr. Francis Rainier? Well, um, just have, like, if, if I can find my words, that would be fantastic. <laughs> um, how interesting of a person he was and how, not just him, how interesting medicine was back then and what being a doctor was like back then because this was back, you know, in Lincoln times. Yeah. So, you know, not modern medicine like we know it today. He, you know, had a lot of older types of medicine. 
Um, yes, that was really cool. And so you're unique because we took this trip to the archives to uh, find out some research um, about, you know, the topic you want. But can you talk a little bit about not just the primary sources that you use, but your own experience um, from some of the knowledge that you got volunteering at New Salem? Well, the thing is, is that when we went to the archives, I could barely find a footnote about um, Rainier. I'm sure if I were to look up just New Salem in general, I would get a lot more mm -hmm. information, but I couldn't find anything about Rainier specifically. So I had to go off of what I already knew and what I was saying at New Salem for so long. Um, and learning all that from volunteering is very interesting and very fun. Um, cool. And then can you talk about the challenges you experienced and some advice that you'd give to other students or anyone trying to do a public history project about their own local area? Um, don't just look at like, in terms of advice, don't just look at like the famous people from that area. Like, you know, you know, New Salem is known for Lincoln and all that, but that he wasn't the only person there. There was at the height of its population, New Salem had about a hundred so residents. There were more than just Lincoln. So learn about the people that were also there. Learn about the people that brought that person their success and all that. In terms of challenges I faced, I think I already said that a little bit and that mm -hmm. I had to basically go off of what I learned from the New Salem Handbook and everything that other volunteers have told me and everything that I've kind of learned just from volunteering and talking yeah. to people during candlelight walks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. There's so much Lincoln's association with new Salem, but your project really demonstrates that there's other people that have been there, right? There's other people that live with Lincoln that contributed to that town. And there's something that kind of captures that sort of sense of forgotten, right? Those sort of forgotten subtle things in history that are so important. So, Amber, thank you so much for sharing this and your work that you've done. Uh, we're going to keep plugging this too, but if you guys haven't seen, there's some great posters in the back with little QR codes that will take you right to the podcast that Amber made and the other students made. So you want to check that out. Um, Jason, let me read a little bit about Jason is our next guest here. Jason's a junior at Cuba High School. He's the son of Georgiana and Christopher Stead. He's involved with History Club, Youth Group, Track and Field, uh, are you doing esports? E we got some esports going on at Cuba High School. Maybe thinking about getting into that. Uh, he enjoys a good old home fashioned cooked meal and Fast and Furious movies and all of Mr. Brewer's history classes. I think I wrote that one in on purpose. Uh, <laughs> and after high school, Jason's thinking about being a truck driver. He is here to discuss his topic how Illinois was divided during the Civil War. So, Jason, to begin, tell us a little bit about why you were curious about this topic and the kinds of questions you were hoping to answer. Uh, well, my dad was in the military, so I was growing up in a very military oriented household. <laughs> so yeah. I've always been very interested in military stuff, in times of war, stuff like that. So I just wanted to know more about the Civil War and how the division of Fulton County and who supported Abraham Lincoln and who didn't support Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, and that's interesting to know, too, that, that it wasn't automatically everybody just loved Lincoln, right? And as we're finding out in research, our county, our, our area was really divided about Lincoln. So um, talk about primary sources and other sources that you were able to uh, identify when you were tackling this project. Uh, well, we found a book called This Infernal War by Tim Roberts, and it was letters between Jane and William Standard, who were right outside of Lewiston, Illinois. Yeah. And then we had uh, Lincoln Technologist in Chief. Um, yeah, and that was that was uh, shared with us. Both of these were shared with us by. Can you tell people who you had a chance to talk to to interview to learn a little bit more about these topics? Uh, I talked to uh, Tim Roberts, as I just said, uh, was the creator of this Infernal War, and I also had a chance to speak with Rick. Uh, he's the president at. Uh, a bank here in Fulton County, and he's a very, he's a Lincoln enthusiast. Yeah, and he, he shares this this awesome document about Lincoln technologists and chiefs. And really, I, I love like listening to your project. It demonstrates that a lot of local rural history is just kind of captured and harbored by some of those anybody anybody that has an interest. And so here's Rick works at a, a bank, and he's kind of harboring this Lincoln in our area sort of history. And and Tim. 
um, has an amazing story. If you guys don't know who Tim is, you got to check out this book, This Infernal War. Jason's like shocked that, oh my gosh, this is people that grew up not far from our school uh, that, that are in this, this area here. And um, these letters, just the survival of those letters was remarkable alone. So can you share maybe one or two tidbits, highlights of something that you learned from talking to these guys and pouring into some of this research about Illinois being divided? Well, uh, I thought it was very fun researching uh, Lincoln's uh, technological mm -hmm. advancements that happened in his time. Yeah. I kind of dug a rabbit hole into that after he gave us the list. And reading This Infernal War was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're finishing that book study in class too, yeah. aren't we? We're, we're doing a book study in Illinois history class. Um, last thing, any any advice you'd give to folks, some challenges that you experienced building a public history project about your own community? Uh, the biggest challenge was finding a good primary source that we could use. And if I had to give some advice, it would be look for as many sources as you can and then talk yeah. to the people who know the most about those sources. All right. Um, any Time for a quick question it's from, from the audience about before we send Amber, Jason on their way. Any quick questions for these guys? And we certainly will have opportunities to talk with them after as well. Okay. Dude, let's move on. Guys, give it up for Amber and Jason. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Braxton, who is a junior at Cuba High School to discuss mining in Western Illinois. And then senior Gavin Johnson is going to discuss his topic, railroads in Western Illinois. So I'm going to go ahead and read Braxton's quick bio here first. Braxton is the son of Justin and Randy Cass and Sarah Humphrey. Braxton's involved with history club, football, basketball, baseball, and some little esports Mario Kart. You guys got to check out esports. It's it's really interesting. Uh, and that's a theme for all these guys. They're so involved in some things. Um, Braxton enjoys Texas Roadhouse. And I hate saying this, but he is a big fan of the Green Bay Packers and the St. Louis Cardinals. I hope that's okay with everyone. And after high school, he's thinking about becoming a mechanic. mechanic. So Braxton, mining in Western Illinois, uh, why did you want to research this topic? And what kinds of questions were you hoping to answer? Um, the reason why I picked this topic is because I live out in, in my whole house and like all the area is complete covered in mining, uh, on Wimatuck. And that's the, that used to be a whole entire mining. That's how we got something, all the lakes got made and all that. And then I kind of went down a rabbit hole of going around where Cuba is and then found like several sites of where the mining was. Like one is right behind the school. The other one is straight heading to Bushnell. Mm -hmm. There's one right there. It's, it's all farm field now. Yes. And what, what I love about your topic, and even if you guys can see uh, Braxton's hat, he's wearing the new Miners mascot. We have a new co-op. Uh, shout out to Coach Pierce, Lewiston, Lewiston teacher here. But the Lewiston Valley Cuba co-op, or new mascot, is the Miners. But a lot of young people have never been alive when the mines have actually been open. But the presence of them living around them is so undeniable. So I love that you wanted to research this topic. As most history really is, people going to work every day, taking care of their families. So with that said, I remember our trip to the archives in Western Illinois. Um, talk about some of the primary sources that you were able to uncover there. And I remember kind of myself getting kind of giddy looking at some of these maps. And, and what, what, what else did you find there? Um, I found some maps like they hand me a book that had a map and then I kind of got bored at looking at because I don't like, like reading so I'm like I'm just going to Google I'm just going to like Google saying see and then I found the exact same image on Google it's just like it's just more I just found the exact same photo just at a different angle and a little bit bigger on Google about exactly what, what the exact same line was and then I just kept on finding pictures and just went through books and just trying to find pictures and I just just went down that rabbit hole just going yeah. through photos and then just found that there's so many a lot of mines out where in Fulton County there's some there's a lot by Lewis and and all that. Yeah. So. And, so, and some of that the, the pictures too of more you know 20th century, some of the strip mining land equipment that was positioned really in our community in places that uh, we drive by every day. And uh even this claim, right? This claim of Cuba being the mining capital of the world. That, was, that's a, that, yeah, that's it really was, interesting. Yeah, it was at one point, I think it was in the 1930s, I think it was, when that got, when Cuba got hit with the, that name. Yeah. Because we had like three mines in that area. And because I remember one of the photos that was, 
it was by a plane. It was in 1939 that was seriously right behind the school. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell them who you talked to. You, you got to talk to one of the coolest, coolest people. I get talked to Davis Lidwell. He's a fifth generation mi- minor of his his family. So, so his whole family has been pretty much growing up with mining and all that. So I get to talk to him, and then he gave me a video. I think it was 1996 when he had his own company. He started recording and then just show what they did yeah. on a day to day life. Yeah, that's really yeah, that's really cool. When you when you you go to the archives and and not just uncover these maps, but then when you talk to uh, Mr. Lidwell, who actually has been harboring some of his own primary sources, knowing that he's working at some of the last mines in the area and he's documenting them, and so handing you a, a DVD that we kind of like play tug of war with a little bit as me and you both were, were watching this DVD of some of the last land reclamation projects. Um, yeah. So we're just giving you guys a taste of Braxton's. If you want to hear more of this conversation, check out uh, our online, those QR codes, visit those posters. Braxton, last question, any challenges uh, that you, you want to share that you overcame advice to give folks for want to do their own local history project? Uh, one of the biggest challenges was, just trying to find like what actually looked like, like back to how the miners were mm-hmm. back in the thirties and all that. Like, yeah, with all this camera and all that, it's a lot easier to get the video, like what Lidwell gave, what he recorded in the ni- 1996. It was kind of hard finding what, how what the miners went through and like way back then, since he was a fifth generation, so what his grandpa went through, so I probably went through yeah. <laughs> from what he said from his, yeah. what he, he had been told by his family. Yeah. And then advice I would give is just find many resources and just find what's in common between them and use that and just try to find more points of view of what's happening because the difference between like the actual miner and the company yeah. and what they both want because there's huge difference between yeah. them. So find, find the two opposites and find what they have in common. Yeah, yeah well said. Thanks, Braxton. Uh, let, let's move on to Gavin over here. Kind of another cool industrial like working project is about railroads in uh, western illinois so gavin's a senior he's the son of dale and patty johnson he loves all things history especially railroads as you're going to find out he enjoys fishing making model railroads and four wheeling gavin's involved in history club bass fishing and another huge green bay packer fan oh boy uh he's a star wars nut his favorite tv show is impractical jokers and after high school gavin's thinking about uh, continue work for the township and possibly even doing some work on the railroad. So, Gavin, talk a little bit about your interest. Why railroads in Western Illinois? So, I've always grown up um, watching, enjoying trains, um, watching them, like having to wait for them. I just enjoyed watching it. Huge machines pulling all this weight across the land, going thousands of miles. And so that inspired me to do this project here to learn about the history of them in Fulton, specifically Fulton County, but this area in general. Um, I focused mainly on one railroad that runs straight through Fulton County, the only railroad there anymore. And I also, uh, in the next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hey, tell them about who you got to talk to. Uh, it was one of my favorite conversations to uh, to be a fly on the wall for. Tell them who you got to talk to. I got to speak to Bill Lighty. Um, he's a local railroad enthusiast. Um, he does public speeches about local uh, about the railroad history. Um, he really knew a lot compared to what I knew. He knew like tons. He grew up in Canton, so he. Told, told this funny story about him when he was littler, jumping out of the bathtub to go look, to go watch the train go by. is pretty <laughs> fun talking to him. Yeah. And his, like, um, mom or somebody's out there chasing him, and he's just running out in his birthday suit just because he hears a train go by. So you guys yeah. really – it was awesome. You guys really connected on this just genuine love of trains. Uh, any any highlights from, from this that you'd like to share? Um. Being able to look at the old maps, the old uh, in the archives, the old atlases of the area, you could see a lot. There's a lot that has changed. Um, things have been torn down. Things have been built. But for the railroads, you can see that a lot has actually been torn down. Kind of goes with Braxton's project, the minings, the mines. Um, there were railroads connecting up to a lot of the bigger ones. Those are all gone now. You can kind of see mm-hmm. like scars in the land from them, but most of that is gone. Mm-hmm. And the railroad that is there now is hardly used, but that used to be um, what Bill said. 
that used to have coal trains running on it pretty much every day. Same with the railroad that used to go through Canton. Um, I don't remember what the railroad was called, but he said it used to have um, coal trains go on it every single day. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I love to, if you guys go online and see, we're just giving you kind of a taste of, of not doing the conversation justice, all the depth that it went into, but you guys really connected on some of the train disasters that have happened in Illinois, even not far from where you live, right? Some of the train crashes and our, our public memory of some of these train accidents just aren't, they don't seem to be as elevated as other, you know, natural tragedies and disasters. But can you talk a little bit about that? Some of the highlights of some of the, the train kind of accidents, um, so I will talk about, um, probably not very many of you know this, but there was a train, a uh, bridge collapsed under a train down in Seville, Illinois. It's not a, it's not a town. It's unincorporated um, community. There's not very many people that live down there, but there was an old train bridge, old iron train bridge. Um, that train was going across and it just collapsed under the weight of the train. Very, it was from built in like the early 1900s. Um, it finally collapsed under the weight of the train. And I got to go down there. My grandma took, took me down there. I got to go down there and see them like cleaning up the mess. Lots of it, whatever the train was carrying, it poisoned the water. Lots of fish died. Is it corn, um, corn syrup or something? Like yeah, that? it was corn syrup. But the good <laughs> thing is a lot of the fish. <laughs> the good thing is a lot of the fish that died were invasive. Oh it's yeah, Asian carp. So yeah, it's not. Oh, that's really, interesting. <laughs> yeah, not the good No, but I got to see that they rebuilt that bridge. I got to kind of see that process too. Um, but I remember going down there and looking at that old bridge like a long time ago before it collapsed and it, there's still pictures of it you can find um i'm pretty sure we talked about that on the podcast as well yeah. if i can remember right yeah um, but that was yeah um you talk about last last question here challenges that you had to overcome seeing this project through and then advice to others that want to build a public history project about their local community challenges was being able to find sources you can't just go look on the internet type things mm -hmm. in because not very many people do research on this area. So you, what you got to do is you got to go in person. Like you go to Cuba, you go into the post office. There's a bunch of pictures of Cuba um, from the 1900s. Some yeah. interesting pictures. You get pictures of the railroads. You get pictures of just the town in general. Say, um, same if you go into Smithfield, you go to the Red Brick School there. Down there in the little cafeteria area, there are pictures yeah. of Smithfield from the early 1900s. You get a picture of pictures of the railroads as well very that's where you got to go to find the this information what was the other part of the question just just some of the uh, advice you give well you kind of did answer it you did yeah. answer it yeah 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 but i just it, go around you got to go around to look people that have lived in that area yeah. for a while question them go look for sources that is not on yeah. the internet well so i really appreciate you saying that. that's when one thing that we really want people to know is that folks that are interested just out of their own self-driven motivation, they really do a lot to harbor their own local town's history. So yeah, even in Cuba, sometimes just the post office can be uh, an archive, right, of, of where people harbor it. So um, Gavin Braxton, thank you guys so much. Let's give it up for Gavin and Braxton. Does anybody, I should ask if anyone has a quick question for him too, but we can certainly save those until the end because of time. All right, you guys are off the hot seat. <laughs> great, great job, guys. Next up, we have um, please welcome Cuba High School sophomores Katie and Courtney Churchill to discuss their topic: getting to know Forgot Tonya's governor. Give it up for the twins. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started because these are some some busy ladies here. Katie and Courtney are sophomores. They are the daughters of Jason and Christy Churchill. Katie is on my right, your left. Uh, she's involved, no, you guys are all on my right. Um, that's not smart. Katie is involved in History Club Cheer, Club Volleyball. Her favorite place to eat is Chick-fil-A. Her favorite TV show is Stranger Things. After high school, Katie's thinking about going to college to become a speech language pathologist. Courtney, over here on my left, is involved in History Club, FCCLA, Drama Club Cheerleading, and Club Volleyball. Another Texas Roadhouse fan. Uh, her favorite TV show is Orange is the New Black, and after high school, she's thinking about being a gynecologist. So I don't know who wants to take this one first or foremost, but 
why did you guys want to research this topic about finding and getting to know Forgot Tonya's governor? If you don't know the Forgot Tonya story, they're going to fill you in. But his name is Neil Gam. Why did you guys want to research this topic? We kind of just wanted to dive deeper into it instead of just being on the surface of it. We just wanted to learn more about Neil Gam and why he was chosen to be the governor of Forgot Tonya. And we just wanted to learn more about it. And it helps that our brother um, also kind of learn more about it. And that's what really got us interested into doing it. And we really, really enjoyed this project. Yeah, so so shout out real quick. Their older brother, Sam, was one of our first students to, to make some podcasts. And I think he talked, now that I remember, I think he talked to James Lowen about some really tough, difficult questions about tracing if our town was a sundown town back in history. And if you guys know who author James Lowen is, Sam did an awesome job at that. So you're trying to trying to follow in, in Sam's footsteps a little bit here. Um, dude, for those that don't know, we got to back up too, because most of my students have never heard the story of Forgot Tonya. And I'm using this word, almost assuming that people do, but Forgot Tonya, the name for these 16 counties in Western Illinois. Can you Phil, folks in that maybe have never heard of who is this Neil Gam guy and what is this Forgotonia origin story here? So based off what I read, it was like these 16 counties that all came together to become their own state. And they were, I think it was just a joke at first and they weren't really serious about it. And then, I mean, then it kind of became widespread and then they're like, oh, well, maybe we should make this like <laughs> our own state. And so then... Um, they had this Neil Gam person who, um, he was a, a really funny guy and he was just a great speaker. And um, I think he was really popular around there. So he was just kind of nominated as that governor and yeah. he really played the role really well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody, everybody that we talk to seems to have that same shared sentiment that he was just perfect to kind of don this governor's attire and take pictures in front of all the rundown things in Western Illinois to kind of gain attraction for this, this message of we need to be more invested in, right? And then that joke kind of gets serious, right? It kind of got serious, tapped into some things. But it's interesting, too, a quick shout out to the Forgot Tonya Brewery, not far from where we're talking about today. If anybody here hasn't been there, they've got some great collections and pictures and other things you can read about it. Um, let's talk about who, uh, what kind of primary sources you guys use when we went and visited Dr. Hollis and Kathy Nichols at the archives. What kind of primary sources did they help you uncover? So when we went there, they they gave us this like huge box, and it was just filled with <laughs> stuff about just Neil Gamp. I mean, and it was filled with the pictures he took with in front of all these like rundown places there yeah. in this Fort Gatonia area and magazines and even Dr. Hollis. Mm -hmm. uh, he had, he wrote a paper about Fort Gatonia and we yeah. read that paper and it was just, it was awesome. There was yeah. everything there that we needed. Um, and so, so for part of this, this project, so you researched some things and we're kind of curating sources here and then uh, something cool happened when we tried to find someone to talk to. This is when you guys probably more than any other group were able to kind of get into this social connection is really strong in small towns. So talk about who you got to talk to, because of course, Neil Gam has passed away a few years ago. So that would have been the great person to talk to, but who did we get to talk to to learn more about him? Uh, we talked to John Marshall. He was a good childhood friend of Neil Gam. He's also a former superintendent of Astoria, like VIT high school. So he was really cool to talk to him and Neil were on the same like baseball team growing up. And like he knew so much about Neil Gam and about Neil Gam's personal life and how Neil Gam wanted to like expand for Gatonia. Yeah. And he's, he's even talking to you guys and telling you, hey, you should try talking to this person, this person. He's tracking some folks down. So definitely this is a project that probably isn't closed, right? As you want to keep learning more about this story. Can you share a highlight or two of from your conversation, something that something that you learned about uh for Gatonia's governor Neil Gam? <laughs> so um a highlight was it was just there was a bunch of information there for us to learn and i, I found all the yeah. uh, answers to the questions i wanted to learn so it was awesome and i got to do it with my sister and we both yeah. really enjoyed it so that was awesome hey and you guys are busy busy talk about challenges 
and advice you have for some other folks trying to follow your footsteps doing a public history project? The challenges were more personal because since mm -hmm. Courtney and I were so busy, it was like just really hard to find time and yeah. motivation yeah. and sometimes even sources yeah. because this, this was something that we did on our own and it wasn't really for a grade. It wasn't for a class. So it's right. like, what are we doing this for? But then we yeah. just, you, you really dig yeah. deeper and then you find your motivation that you really yeah. want to learn about yeah. for God's name. Yeah. And, and commend you guys too. Cause you saw this through when this was not for a class and you are busy enough. You just did this out of your own curiosity. So I really, really appreciate this. And, and again, if you haven't, uh, uh, Got to hear some of these. You guys got to listen to their their uh, podcast with um, Mr. Uh, John Marshall, right? And there's it's definitely a project that I think can still keep going uh, as we have more to more to talk to. So um, we'll go ahead and have you guys step off. We'll just do some questions at the end because of time. We want to get going here, but let's give it up for Katie and Courtney. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Next up is uh, Cooper Leonard. Please welcome high school sophomore Cooper Leonard to discuss his topic, experiencing a rural school closure. All right, Cooper is also a sophomore at Cuba High School. He's the son of Randy and Megan Leonard. He's involved in history club, drama club, track and field, and he works as a student technology specialist for Cuba High School. Uh, for this guy right over here, Justin, streaming some games. He's, I've been a part of that too. He does a great job of helping us out with there. He enjoys soccer. <laughs> baked potatoes, sleeping, <laughs> hanging out with friends, and following his curiosity. After high school, Cooper is thinking about going to Bradley University to get a degree in science or engineering. So rural schools closure, right? Why did you want to research this topic? Um, when we when History Club first started this year, you gave us a wide variety of topics, I remember, and some of it, like, no one even did. Right. And it's just another good thing to look at later. And I, and the, one of the topics was actually the decline of rural schools. And I thought that was really interesting. So I thought I'd take a look at it and see if I enjoy it. And so I did. And then I remember finding a bunch of information right at first about how many schools actually closed down. And it was a surprisingly high amount in Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes you're going to school every day and you just don't have an opportunity to truly reflect on the story of your school. And I know that one of the cool things we did, I don't know if you were there that day in History Club, were you there when we, we just kind of walked down the hallways to just pause and look at the pictures of graduating classes, look at some of the pictures of like what our old school used to look at, pour into some yearbooks. And for us, that's really where a lot of this project started is in our school. And I love your project because it's about not just our school, but schools in the area, right? Which you really personally connected to. So then yeah. you come to the archives and you get an opportunity to work with some professionals like John Hollis. Kathy Nichols, what were some of the resources that they were able to help you uncover about this topic? Um, I got a lot of different books. Uh, Tales from Two Rivers, there was a bunch, there was seven of them, I do believe. And the, seven, the seventh of the seven books was actually really useful. It contained a bunch of stories about rural schools. All of them contained small segments in it, but number seven had the most useful information. There was also Memories of the Heart, Rural Schools in Illinois by Warren Royer. And this book actually featured, it was, Cuba was in it from, yeah, it was, school, I yeah. think, the late 1800s. Yeah. It was really interesting. It was more from a teacher's perspective, but it was still really cool. Mm -hmm. And another one was rural oh, one-room schools in Hancock County. It's not our county, but mm -hmm. it is also close by, mm -hmm. and it gives us some kind of insight into what schools would be like back then. Yeah, well said. And I, and I, I love to kind of almost accidentally finding in this book little experts from Cuba from our school, and you were also interested in Smithfield too, like the Smithfield school. Yeah, the school. Smithfield so, Bedrick School, which uh, Gavin mentioned earlier. Yes, yeah. um, the Redrick School in Smithfield closed down some years ago. Um, some of the people in the audience might know of it, and uh, I actually got leading into probably one of your next questions. I got to interview um, Miss Miss Col Coleman. yeah Miss Daryl Coleman. Yeah. And uh, she used to be the principal there, and she was also the person who helped create our high school that we are in now. And it, our high school is actually one of the first, actually, no, the first fully green school. And she was really proud of that, and I know she was pushing towards that, which we had a good conversation about that in our podcast. And I was really interested, I was 
fascinated and interested in the startup of the school and what brought it. And the reason, the whole reason behind the Red Brick School closing, even though it's still, it's still kept in shape, you know, yeah. like they still yeah. have it open. They use it for the uh, chicken, chicken noodle soup yeah. thing yeah. Uh, yeah. every year. That's a big deal, yeah, man. It's a, Fulton it's County, really cool. chicken noodle soup, Smithfield Red Brick School, right? Uh-huh. Um, which was kind of an interesting point you connected with too in, in, in some of your research. A lot of towns are so emotional when that school building closes up mm -hmm. and they have to make a tough decision to consolidate, but they find uses out of that building. And Smithfield really demonstrates that better than any other community that we know of is this, how we still use that Red Brick School and share it with the mm -hmm. community. So, I mean, even in Cuba, we used our old elementary school oh, yeah, community yeah. center keeping yep. it around. Yeah, we yeah. don't want to just destroy it and get rid of it. We want to keep everything around. <laughs> right. Um, which I, is always really cool. Yeah, yeah. And I love that it was, it was kind of a happy accident, too, because you weren't aware that, that Mrs. Coleman was there at Smithfield when it closed down, which is one school you were interested in more than, than, than any others. And yeah, she's also it's represents. the closest that I know that it's closed yeah. down. And then she represents this story of, which kind of hit me a little bit because um, I didn't realize mm -hmm. you guys were kind of just being born, you know, when our newer school at Cuba was born. So we have another kind of story history there, too, of our own school, mm -hmm. how this fits in. Um, so you got to talk to Daryl Coleman. Any other highlights or tidbits you think are worth sharing in this interview about that that conversation? Um, I really he had a lot of fun with her. She was a really nice lady. Yeah. Uh, she clearly was passionate about the school. When I could tell when she was just talking about the new school and the whole plan around it and raising money for that, the whole plans and everything like that, she was clearly very passionate about it. And even though she knew the other school was closing, she knew this yeah. would be a new start in a great new building for yeah. years to come. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, it was a really meaningful conversation you guys got to listen to between a, a young man who's a student now and then even getting some just genuine conversation with a recent retiree who's invested their life in rural education. I, I just thought there were some many, really meaningful things said. Hey, Cooper, last question. What challenges did you personally experience and advice you give to others trying to do public history project in their rural community? The biggest challenge was probably, for my more specific looking into the Red Brick School, there's not a lot of documents I found uh, on that school specifically. If I went to a library in there, I probably could have, but I never found the time to. I might eventually my own free time in the future. But um, the biggest problem was just sources, but I ended up finding some good ones. And uh, my interview was the best source I could have really asked for because she knew a lot. Yeah. And some yeah. advice, which I'm surprised no one's mentioned yet, is just be passionate about the topic. If you're passionate about it, it makes it so much easier and you want to it makes it so much more fun to learn. Yeah. Well said, man. Let's give it up for Cooper Leonard. All right. Our, our last little segment here is please welcome Cuba High School junior Ella Bass to discuss her topics, the protest at Dixon Mound. Um, okay. A bit about Ella. She's a junior at Cuba. She's the daughter of Angie Thomas and Jeff Bass. Ella is involved with History Club, Dance Force, SCCLA. She volunteers at the YWCA, teaching kids things like ballet, tap, and jazz dance. Her favorite place to eat is McDonald's. That's, that's good. Uh, after high school, she's thinking about going to Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, to get degrees in plant biology, forestry, zoology, and would like to become either a marine conservationist are a wildlife conservationist. And isn't that cool too, the diversity of students that we have still demonstrating history is important whatever you do, right? It's important whatever you do. Don't try to have a future without your relationship to some history. So I love that about all you guys. Ella, protest at Dixon Mounds. Talk about why you're interested in this topic. Um, I have always been interested in Dixon Mounds. Um, my family used to go there all the time and I remember being afraid of the second floor because it was dark and they played the in the classic Indian music and yeah. it was just like really scary and it was dark. And then I learned from my mom that under the tarp, like they never, um, there were just like bodies there, like there were skeletons and that just freaked me out more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I, I still like learning about it, yeah. but I always think about that, like why they would just leave it like yeah. that. Yeah, and it's really interesting too because I know I know some folks in the audience were certainly around when that got to be a pretty uh, contentious kind of place. But to be kind of growing up around this time now, it's a little bit different experience with the memory. So 
poured into the history of this this protest movement at Dixon Mounds was a really cool topic for a young person to to find out about. And testament to you here, because I want the next question is going to be, how did you use primary sources for this project? And you did a lot of hunting even outside of the archives. Mm -hmm. So talk a little about some of the stuff that you used. Um, when we went to the archives, I found some field notes published by Dixon Mounds in the early 1990s when it actually happened. So those were really interesting. Th those were the ones that I used as my primary source. But I also used the Dixon Mounds website also. So. Um, hey, share, share um, oh gosh, and, and even some videos I remember to mention some of the raw footage of the protests as a primary source. Um, and, then, and then a really cool video of a, of a tribal group that still visits the mountain annually mm -hmm. today to uh, uh, honor ancestors, right? So share a couple highlights of things that you put on the podcast that you'd like people to know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about just talk about challenges then, some of the challenges you experienced okay. just carrying on this project. Um, the challenges would definitely have to be my timeline. Um, I didn't really have a timeline, but the timeline that I did have, I was expecting to have people to interview. And the people that I wanted to have to interview, um, their schedules did not work with my timeline. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that was really rough. But um, Yeah, and we don't, we don't even want to over-romanticize like, carrying on a project like this. It is so meaningful for young people to, to set a goal of like, seeing a project through and following through on that, and, and when you have a world of other things going on. But what I love about Ella's project too is, this is a tough issue. This is a tough questions to wrestle with. And sometimes in local history, we can be a bit about just the good stuff to celebrate and then avoid some of the tough questions that we have to wrestle with. And that's not a good idea to invest in our communities, to invest in the future without giving a space for young people to ask some really tough, tough questions. So guys, give a listen to Ella's um, podcast. She did a great job of talking about these protests. And some of you guys are around the, the area, the community might, might remember this. And um, Dixon Mountains is an awesome place. It's still around today. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to go back and visit it post-COVID when they've kind of opened up some of these other other things. Um, anything else you'd like to share that I haven't asked? Um, the complications. Yeah, yeah, the challenges, complications. Sure. Um, with the timeline, it was just like really rough. And um, if you do have a timeline, you most definitely have to be prepared to have setbacks and have dead ends. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> it's great. really rough. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, guys, I guess that's it. Give it up for Ella Bass. Here for a picture. No, not, not just yet. Not just yet. This is the letter time, right? Yeah. So guys, at this time, I'm going to um, share some words really quick with you from Dr. Hallwiss and Kathy Nichols over at the archives. They were also just really important community partners for us to carry out their work. We wouldn't have a lot of this memory if it wasn't for the work that they do simply harboring and collecting. And this is why we position this work out here in Macomb is it's kind of like the cultural mecca for us. To visit the archives was just a cool experience to see all the stuff, all the history. So I'm reading a quick letter from um, Dr. Hallwiss and Kathy, and this is also directed at you guys. So I want you guys to pay attention to, to this as well. Um, so Kathy Nichols says, Dr. Hallwiss and I were pleased to hear through your teacher, Mr. Brewer, that you found your experience in the archives and special collections at Western Illinois University to be of interest and value. Also, we were pleased to learn of the podcast you created based on research in the unit and your subsequent experience and uh, to be very interesting. Well, of course, we hope the work you did with our help and that of Ms. Scott will inspire you to engage in additional research into the past of your own town and county and region in Illinois. Much is possible as students, professional historians, and ordinary people build on the knowledge of those who have come before them. We would also like for you to know that your visit with us this past fall to learn about our regional depository with its vast collection of historical materials served as a model for subsequent events. And so we're actually in the process of arranging for similar meetings in the unit this year with area high school history and English classes, including ones from our own county. So all of you were trailblazers, which is something to certainly be proud of. And that is awesome words from John and uh, Kathy over at the archives. Right. 
So thank you very much for your attention. Is there any questions or comments that you would like to share with our students or each other this afternoon? <laughs> I just want to say I'm really proud of them because they took this on, I mean, not, a, not an assignment, but they took this on themselves to learn more about their community. And as a parent, I'm very proud. Yes. So. Let's give that up. Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious, do you uh, plan to continue any of these research projects on your own? I have that question too. That's a great question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Response. Um, I was, I do archery. My archery coach actually knows the people who still like take care of the Red Brick School. So I thought of possibly talking to them and like what their drive is behind like keeping the school around, like more personal on that school. So that's my possibility for a way to continue on this school. Cool. Yeah. Anyone else have anything? Well, I know we, we talked to all, they all have ideas too of different ways they could expand and even do new topics. Um, and hopefully that's one that, that not only are you guys connecting with students, but just in the audience and, and, and at home listening that history is alive. Whenever we're curious about it, we ask questions about it. Uh, and then ultimately, if we can share it with others, that's what makes history alive. Uh, it, it's why it's not a stagnant subject. It, it, um, uh, it's meaningful when you elevate the consciousness, these awareness of something. And as all these students said, too, some of that rural, small town stuff isn't just going to intentionally be told until someone asks a question. So uh, we, that's what we want to do is just keep encur encouraging that curiosity. And uh, we, we neglected to say, too, Regina kind of brought up, we, we got some really cool headphones and mics from this grant doing this project. And so they see it in our room every day right there. They have access to it all the time. That uh, So... Hopefully, we'll keep continuing. You guys can listen for more. Yeah. My name is Mike Russell. I'm a member of the uh, Lewistown Historical Society. And we have, uh, in our purvey, the blacksmith shop, the dress yeah. the blacksmith shop. Yeah. And behind that, the museum, which uh, houses uh, a number of uh, artifacts which would have been covered by many of your interests here. Yeah. And we also have the narrow gauge railway. And I would like to extend invitation for any of the students who want to continue to consider us a resource. I would be happy to uh, getting that afford access yeah. and uh, show them what, what is there for their uh, use. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thanks, Mike. Good to see you. Good to see you. And since it's the Russell's talk, hey, I just want yeah. to thank Mr. Brewer for, for getting this spark of oh, creativity you, yeah. and joy here in our rural community school. I know a lot of these kids, it's fun to watch them grow <laughs> up and, and see that love yeah. of learning really yeah. excited. We're excited you guys came too, and and, and, and I, man, we definitely need to take some of the blacksmith shop too as more a resource. But that's one thing to highlight is is when students first come into history, we kind of gravitate towards those really adventurous war stories and things that are just sensational. But we forget that most people are trying to work, trying to take care of people that they love, and that is a meaningful experience when you ask questions about that. And that is really the strong part of our cultural heritage here in Western Illinois. So I really appreciate taking you up on that too. Another question, yeah. Um, my name is Bruce Morton, now a photographer. Hey, Bruce, yeah. And uh, I would like to encourage all your students <clears throat> to take pictures when you're doing your research mm -hmm. because you're the history now, and that's real important for the future. Uh, you know, just take your phone, take pictures of anything. Yeah. Uh, you might think of, they may not even be of any importance to you at the moment, but 30, 40, 50, 100 years from now, they might be. Yeah. So, and don't just leave them on your phone, get them edited, <laughs> because there's so much corruption and stuff in technology sure. that you'll probably lose. Yeah. So, yeah. And I highly encourage you to photograph them during that, your projects. Yeah, and thanks, Bruce. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, too. And that's somebody you guys have probably seen Bruce, some of Bruce's work and don't realize who he is, but I bet you've seen some of his work, so. Anybody else? I think for me, the big takeaway, thank you for inspiring me in my work. You showed me that we are all have a sort of responsibility, and I'm hearing this from all of you, 
um, I, you know, I'm challenged now to make sure that we preserve as much as we can so that we can continue to like learn and, and know about our history yeah. and our people and our day-to-day -day life. So that's my big takeaway. And I, I, again, I think it's all incumbent upon all of us. So let's go team. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> let's go team. So thank you. And yeah. do you have any closing just, remarks? Thank just, you, Joe. No, thank you. you. Hey, hey, and that's just the final thing I want to leave really quick is, is this is a celebration of you guys. Thank you guys. Uh, we are all, everybody's just a product of some of the good people we have around us. You know, you're, you're never alone in your quest to preserve history and your ambitions to do whatever it is that you are pursuing. But please don't try to do it without some relationship for the history and, and the lessons that we have. I challenge anybody to invest in our future without incorporating those lessons from history and trying to do it alone too. So anything that I've done has just been a product of people like Sue. We gravitated towards this museum because Sue is doing some really cool, non-traditional, what I just call non-traditional history collection things, you know, beyond just putting that caption up, uh, but also quick shout out to not just the archivist, Dr. Hallwitz, if you guys know him, um, has probably done more than just anybody else preserving this area. Um, Kathy Nichols, and you guys got to give it up for Justin, Justin. over here, too. He looks like he's not doing it. Thank you. Thank you. I've said right. my piece. Thank you. So now please hang out. And that's another part of history is the sharing and yes, community. Yes. So there's brownies and cookies, oatmeal cookies, and some coffee. So please feel, uh, feel free. All right. Thank you for Thank coming. You Thank you.